As we finish this series today, uh, God is a God of healing, that healing is actually possible. Uh, no matter what you're going through, we've been talking about physical pain, we've been talking about emotional pain, spiritual pain, all sorts of things. We believe that healing is possible. Thank you, God. It just isn't big enough. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to make it look really awkward with this giant table up here. Uh, but a- anyway, um, here's the deal. Here's how life works. Life is, uh, we have some commonalities. All of us, no matter what season of life you're in, we tend to use different things in life to fill our cup, all right? We all have these things. It's, it's Netflix, it's, it's that good book, it's, it's maybe the vacation. We got a lot of our church family, obviously, on spring break vacation just to fill our cup, man, all right? Because life is tough. Maybe these are good things. He's the shepherd, but then at the very end, it shifts, and it shifts to pointing to him as a host. Everybody say Host. So, so it was shepherd, now he's host. Let's read this and let's see this play out. Well, let's start with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Actually, let's do this. I don't know if we got it on the screen. Yeah, we got it on the screen. Let's read it together, all right? Let's read this whole thing together. Why don't we stand together and, and read this? And some of you are like, oh my goodness, I, I just sat down. I'm sorry. It's the joy of being this person. You're on stage. Just stand up. Now, why don't you sit down? I know you stand up, all right? Just, just need it. Okay. All right. All right, verse 1. Let's read this together. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And here we go. Here's the shift. Here we go. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. That is an awesome message. That is a picture of hope. Our big idea as we do finish this this chapter right here is that there is a table prepared for you. A table. A table prepared for you. I don't know what your week has been like. Right? I have no idea the struggles that have come this week. I don't know the pain that you've endured. I don't know if you've had a fantastic week. It was spring break. I mean, it couldn't have been that bad for you students, right? I mean, it was spring break. At least you had that. I don't know if it was a good week or a bad week. I don't know if work was fantastic or if it was a train wreck. I don't know. All of us are are in different seasons. I know for some of us, it was one of the hardest weeks of our life, this week, right? But whether it was a great week or whether it was a challenging week, you have a table prepared for you, a table prepared for you. So this is what verse 5 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. All right, I want to I focus on that very first part today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All right, now depending on the timing of when Psalm 23 is written would determine who David's enemies are that he's referring to. Right Now, if he is, in fact, going through the Kidron Valley, like we talked about last week, and in fact, he's he's referring to Absalom and his men, right? Read Psalm 3, and Psalm 3 is literally him fleeing his own son. You remember that? His own son trying to kill him and take his kingdom, right? Now, my guess is um, you have pain, you have struggle, you have a past, but my guess is most of us don't have a past of a son trying to murder us and take our kingdom that we helped establish. Like, we can't relate to that. But we can relate to enemies. You have enemies today. Some are like, yeah, I know. I got enemies. I want to speak for a second about who your enemies aren't for just a second. Can I do that? Who are, like, who are the enemies of the follower of Jesus? If you're a Christian today, who are our enemies? And, And if that's the case, Who are not our enemies? I want to suggest to you today that your enemies, if you're a follower of Jesus today, your enemy is not someone who automatically uh, is a part of a a, a different political party. It doesn't make them your enemy, right? right? It doesn't, I assure you, all right, hear me, hear me. 
I assure you, there is wickedness on both sides of the aisle. It is there. All right? It is there. So that's not the enemy of the follower of Jesus. Autom- automatically, if you voted for this person, you're, you're an enemy. No, 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 that's not, not how this works. All right? Your enemy is not a fellow Christian, a fellow Christian that disagrees with you on some trivial issue. That's not your enemy. Stop fighting them. That's not them, right? Like, like something has happened over the past 13 months, right? A pan, uh, another pandemic has surfaced where, where within the church we're just mad at each other. Right? We're just mad and, and it's over trivial things like, my goodness, who cares, right? I think we can all agree. Like, I, I know we can all agree that, that if, if our enemy as a follower of Jesus is a fellow Christian that disagrees on things like masks or no masks, vaccines or no vaccines. Like, like if we disagree on that, if that makes them your enemy, you're just looking for a fight. Right? Stop looking for a fight. They're not your enemy, all right? Just because they have a different perspective on some things does not make them your enemy. So we must stop treating them like our enemy because they're not. Another that's not your enemy. Your enemy is not someone that has a different color of skin than you. Right? Sometimes in the, in the back of our minds, like, like, like they, they have a different perspective, so they're our enemy. But your enemy is not an individual that has a different color of skin than you. And, and because of this, they have different views on race. Right? Like if your skin was a different color, you might have a different view on race than what you have right now. I had a fantastic, uh, kind of the, the end of the week, um, uh, Tommy and I, uh, we got to go to a pastor's, a denominational pastor's conference in Arizona. Had a fantastic um, conversation uh, with a, a black pastor that is, I'm going to guess, in his 60s. And it just so happens we're in Phoenix, but he's in Midwest City. Like, that's crazy. I had never met this person before in my life. And we had an incredible conversation about race in the church, about race. And, and let me tell you, a 60-year-old black man has a different view of race than a 36-year-old white man. That's just, we have different perspectives, we, we have different backgrounds, we have different upbringings. His views are very different than mine. Right? I, I have no idea, we didn't talk about like, like politics and stuff. I wouldn't doubt one bit that he voted maybe different than I did. He's not my enemy. Right? We, we are both on the same team. I right, understand this is why I love this church. Like, oh my goodness, this is why I'm so thankful for this group of people. Because I know you agree with me on this. If you, in the back of your mind, feel somehow that you are elevated over another race, right? If you feel elevated over, okay, one, repentance. Repentance for the pride that we're showing, the arrogance that we're showing, to think that we're superior to somebody. Like, do we realize how, like, how annoyed a racist would be in heaven? He would hate heaven, right? Because it's all the nations right there. So you either repent or you're going to hate heaven if you make it in, right? You're, you're going to hate it. But listen, there's another option, and this is why I love this church. Find another church right? If we think that we are elevated over another race, either repent and we're going to come alongside of you and we're going to work together to build a church that that reflects our our community and the kingdom of heaven. But if we aren't willing to repent and we do feel that way, you're going to hate it here. So just go ahead and and find another church because this church has got to be wired different. Do we realize we're, we're going to a church that, that is surrounded by the nations? Like, like it's, it's every nation that, that's around us. It's not just Hispanic. It's not the African-American community. It's not the Asian community. It's, it's, it's everywhere, right? It's, it's, it's every single nation. At our church, if we're going to reach this community, we've got to become a people who change our view of enemy. We've got to become a people who, who are passionate we are desperate to see an Asian. We are desperate to see here, but feel at home here, right? To see a, a, a black man in leadership of this church, because that's our community. So, so if we're not going to go towards repentance, 
Find a church that's not in this community. Find a different church, please. Because we need people who are passionate about this community, passionate about loving people that look very different than them. Because the kingdom of heaven looks very different than you and me. It's not your enemy. But it doesn't mean you don't have enemies. Oh, you have enemies. Right? I don't want to suggest, I don't want to come up here and, and make it sound like you, you don't have enemies, that the follower of Christ doesn't have enemies. You do. You have enemies. Your enemies are those, listen to me, your enemies are those that have wronged you, tricked you, hurt you, persecuted you, and are trying to bring your life to ruin intentionally or subtly through the normalization of sin, the opposition to the teachings of Jesus, and the destruction of the church. I'm going to say that again, and I know some of you got a teacher right here, like she's like, that was a run-on sentence, Matt, right? I know, that's a really long sentence, all right? I know, I'm sorry, Amy, but I want you to hear it again. I want you to, I'm going to say this again because I want it to soak in. Your enemy, as a follower of Jesus, it's not all the things we commonly make our enemy. Your enemy are those that have wronged you, tricked you, hurt you, and persecuted you, and are trying to bring your life to ruin intentionally or subtly through the normalization of sin, the opposition to the teachings of Jesus, and the destruction of the church. That's your enemy. Not the follower of Jesus who, who has a different view on a, on a matter that, that isn't core to our found, the foundations of our faith. Our enemies are people that are, are trying to attack our beliefs, trying to, to, to attack our way of life through the normalization of sin and, and ignoring the, the, the teachings of Jesus through, through the destruction of the church. This is our enemy. This is who the enemy of the follower of Christ is. And I assure you that this person exists on CNN and Fox News. They're there, both of them. So please, 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 like before I move on from that, please, I'm begging you, do not allow news to be our main for a source of discipleship. Please, we must stop this. Not we as Oak Hill Church, we as the church, the American church. It's not our discipleship. The word of God is our discipleship, and it disagrees with both sides a lot. While there is part of us that wants to fight fire with fire, because you're probably wired like me, and if somebody wrongs you, what do we want to do? We want to wrong them, right? It's just kind of human nature. David recognizes when the Lord is with us, we aren't consumed in destroying our enemies. Did you catch that? We're seated at a table amongst them. They're, they're all around us, but we're at a table, and the cup, baby, is overflowing in our life. This is completely different than the tendency to just fight every single battle. The table changes our perspective. The table changes our perspective in life. Have you ever heard the phrase, um, they're playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. You ever heard that phrase? It's a phrase that, that speaks to like, like, like this person with the same setting, the same context. They're just on a different level, right? They're thinking about things different. They're operating things different. It can be at work. It can be in athletics. It's like, like man, everyone else is playing checkers. But this person, man, he is on a different level. She is on a different level. She's playing chess, right? So often in life, Followers of Christ are in the middle of playing checkers when we've been equipped to play chess, to operate on a different level. Right, think of it this way. Think of, think of playing uh, chess while other people are playing checkers. Think of it as the, the Chick-fil-A drive through <laughs> Those folks, they're playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers, right? Like it's, just, it's different. It's like the craziest thing. Hundreds and hundreds of cars just fly through there. It's, the kitchen has to be the same size as McDonald's kitchen. Right? They're only producing so much chicken, but there's something about the system that they have. It's, it's incredible. And not only that, I, I happened to catch it on a day. Uh, it was during the, the really, really cold weather, and so their, their people weren't outside, and that's really what makes the system fly, right? It's the people as they're, you're, they're walking, as you're driving. Um, it wasn't like that. But something about Chick-fil-A, like I waited a, a way longer than I would normally wait because um, there were hundreds of cars. It was all the way backed up in the Target. Like, like it was bad. It was Chick-fil-A, so I wasn't mad, right? Like, isn't that weird? Have you ever been like, like, just, because even when it, like, they're just playing chess while everyone else is playing chess, it's just, it's just different, it's better, it's just, it's just a better experience. Playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. I do believe 
that followers of Jesus, we have an ability to play chess while everyone else is playing checkers, to operate on a different level, to not get, get bogged down by, by the weeds and not get bogged down by, by the dirt. Here David is telling us, when the Lord is our shepherd, we aren't having to get in the mud and the dirt. We operate on a different level. But don't get me wrong. Read 2 Samuel and you're going to find David fights many battles. All right? So don't come up to me after service and be like, yeah, but David, he fought a lot of battles. You're not going to see a level of peace and blessing in his life in these battles. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of family turmoil comes through these battles. He fights them. But where is he experiencing this overflowing cup? When he's at the table. When he's operating on a different level. It's only when we begin to understand the magnitude of this that we begin to understand how Jesus views our enemies. Right? Like, like it's only when we understand that we can play chess when everyone else is playing checkers. We don't have to fight every single battle because we can be at a table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. Our head is anointed with oil and our cup is overflowing. It's only when we understand that that the teachings of Jesus as it pertains to how we treat our enemies could possibly make sense. Right? Because what does he, he say about our enemies? This is what he says in Matthew 5. The, the words of our Lord and Savior. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, at the surface, that sounds like some weak pacifist mindset. Like, how could you do that? That's not the way we do things. We fight. But here, it's this, this different picture. You've heard that it's said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. They can be surrounding you, but you are at a different level. You're operating at a different level. You, you understand the goodness and the mercy of God. You understand that you have been blessed, that, 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 that the rest of the world is trying to fill their cup and it's just pouring out, but you operate on a whole different level. Because you know the goodness of God. You've experienced the goodness of God. You've received the mercy and the grace of God. So we don't have to be down here in the muck. We're up above. We're, 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 we're different. We're playing chess when everyone else is playing checkers. I want to read to you an email that I got uh, this past week. Early, I guess it was two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. I shared this with our Thursday morning prayer team. We're going to be meeting uh, again uh, this week. I want to encourage you to join that Zoom call. I shared this. Those of you that were on that uh, that call, this will sound familiar. This is from um, our denominational mission board, okay? Um, you guys know we, we showed the video of Tommy talking to some of our partners in India just, I don't know, a couple months ago. Um, we sponsor a church. Uh, we pay the salary of a pastor in India, pay his full salary uh, of, a, of a mission work in India. This was in, from India this uh, two weeks ago. Urgent prayer. Sister Rinku, I won't say her last name, Sister Rinku took water baptism. She came home, mission to receive baptism, later seeing the new Bible in her hands, beat her mercilessly and burnt the Bible. She was asked to leave the home, so she came to our church planner's house and spent the night. Please pray for her so that her life will be protected and she will stand strong for Jesus. She is a strong believer, but facing this persecution. A few days later, the dear woman Rinku went to be with her husband. But her husband told her, you changed your religion, so you cannot stay with me. Husband's family members are putting pressure, so once again, Rinku left the home and is now staying with her mother and younger sister. She said to us, this is just days ago, she said to us, whatever may happen to me, I am not going to forsake my Savior, Jesus. He suffered for me, let me suffer for him a little. I, I will come for prayer meetings and Sunday services. Please, Pray for me. Rinku is playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. All right, this woman, that's persecution. Her, her husband is, is denying her, burning the Bibles, beating her mercilessly. But what, what's her perspective? Did you catch it? Like, like, what is she not focused on? Revenge. What is she not focused on? Like, like seeing her enemies destroyed. What is she focused on? Bringing honor and glory to God. Because she knows, like this is a woman who knows that she can be surrounded by her enemy, but her cup is overflowing because she has tasted the goodness of knowing Jesus Christ. This is playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. You guys have heard it said, don't wrestle with the pig. You both get muddy, but the pig likes it. 
Christians today, we're just wrestling with the pigs, man. And, and you can squint really hard, you can't tell who the Christian is in the fight because they're both so muddy. May we, may we see, may we operate at a different level that our enemies are not who we often think they are or act that they are. Our enemies are those that are attacking the faith, attacking your belief. The enemies are, are, are Rinku's uh, you know, culture and world that is literally trying to take her life. That's an enemy. And how do we treat those people? We love them. We pray for them. And the only way that that could possibly make sense is if we realize our cup is overflowing. We're playing chess, what everyone else is playing checkers. I want to encourage you, stop playing checkers. Stop being down here in the muck. We're done with that. Play chess. Understand the goodness of God, that even when our enemies are around us, He is good. Amen? And He loves us. Last thing about this, this table. I'm not a guest. This is my home. This table where the cup is, is overflowing. This is not some temporary table. This is my home. That, that my life, even through the, the trials and the tragedies, even when, when life is not going good, even when you're in the hospital and, and you're, you're worried that your leg may not make it through the month, like, like even then, we can overflow because we're not a guest at this table. It's our home. Right? You guys have all um, had guests in your home. And depending on the relationship, depending on, on the circumstances, um, maybe it was hours, maybe it was days, maybe they were staying in your house for months uh, because they needed help, whatever the case may be, at some point, they overstayed their welcome, right? Like at some point, there, there is an end to this, unless you want to chip in with the mortgage, right? Like there is, there is an end eventually, and it might be a long time, it's different for the circumstance, right? But our table... Is not some temporary stay. It's permanent. Remember the valley of the shadow of death? What do we do with the valley of the shadow of death? We walk through it. It is but a temporary stay for the follower of Jesus. But the table? Well, this is forever. Right? The, the goodness of God, like it never runs out. The cup continues to overflow. This is what it says in verse 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is life. It's constant. It never runs dry. It can be our dwelling place, place forever. It's not a place that's earned. It's a gift. Because God is good. Even when life is struggling, even when life is not going good, His love is good. His grace is good. His mercy is true. His kindness never ends. His forgiveness is unrelenting. In Luke 15, you see a passage that, that really points to this. Luke 15 is that, that really uh, uh, popular parable uh, that, that Jesus gives where you have two brothers and the youngest one is asking for his inheritance. You remember this, this parable, the prodigal son? Well, the youngest one is, is asking for his inheritance. So just kind of a quick recap. Like, like the father in this story gives the youngest son his inheritance early. Right? But the youngest son squanders it, right? He goes off and he lives lavishly and he does all these amazing things, but he squanders this this, this wealth that he once had on wild living, right? And it gets so bad to, to where he's, he's out of money and he's looking for a job. Famine hits the land and this guy is hopeless. So he gets a job tending pigs, right? And, and it gets so bad that it, point, it paints a picture of, of this guy who was once a wealthy son, right? Once given a gigantic sum of money, this guy is now longing for the food that the pigs are eating, Right, you remember that story? Raise your hand if you remember this story from, from growing up. Right, but, but here's what happens. Verse 20. He comes to his senses, all right? He's like, wait a second, why, why am I doing this when my father is like an unbelievable wealthy man and I, could, I would rather work for him than, than slum it with the pigs, right? This is what he says in verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. <coughs> but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Let's prepare a table. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is the picture of the table. 
It's for everyone, and it's always available. There is, you don't overstay your, your welcome here. It's for the individual who hasn't really had like this overly rebellious phase of life. You know, you know the type. You're the ones that don't want to share your testimony in public because you feel like some weak Christian. You never really had that phase. This table's for you. This table is overflowing, and it's for you, and, and life is difficult, and, and pain and tragedy come, but, but it's, overwhelm, it's overwhelming and overflowing. But it's not just for you. It's also for the individual that has made some really stupid decisions in life, and we know it. The individual that, that threw out their moral compass years ago. The individual that, that has hurt people and broken people and run from Jesus. Maybe we got saved when we were, we were in camp, when we were in sixth grade, but that was a long time ago. This table's still here. It's right here. It's still available, and it's overflowing with goodness and mercy. It's available to us. Or maybe we're here today, and we've never tasted the goodness of knowing Jesus. Never in our life have we given our life to Jesus. Or we're watching today, and that's foreign to us. The table is right here. Right? The relationship with God is, is right here for the taking. And it's not some temporary thing. It's forever. It's an overflowing cup. So whether we're longing for physical healing or emotional healing, or maybe we're longing for spiritual healing, because we have ran so far, may we know that the table is there in the presence of our enemies. Our head is anointed with oil, and our cup, it overflows. Do we believe that today? Do you believe that in the midst of what you're going through? Not that, that you can have an overflowing cup, that's the, that's the issue that we often have as followers of Jesus. We believe this, we hear a sermon like this, and it's like, like, yeah, we can have that. No, you do have this. It is here. Right? We can have, and we do have, an overflowing cup. So may we get out of the muck and acting like we're, we're running on empty, and may we realize that because of the goodness of God, our cup, it overflows. Our big idea of the week, there is a table prepared for you. No matter what you've done, how distant you've become, no matter who you viewed your enemies as, we can shift all that, we can change all that, we can grow the church that God is calling us to grow in all that, and we can go forward with an overwhelming, overflowing cup because of the goodness and mercy and grace and love of God. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. As heads are bowed and, and eyes are closed, we have something in common, you and I. We get distracted by how to get an overflowing cup. It is not going to be found in working your way up to the C-suite of your corporation. Ah, the good life, right? It's not going to be found in that relationship where the grass looks greener on the other side. Just water your own grass. Right? It's not going to be found in, 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 in all the, the free time and the vacation. That wears off quick. The overflowing, overwhelming cup is only going to be found in knowing Jesus Christ. So I have a couple of questions as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I just want to raise, want you to raise your hand. I want to, to just pray for you. I'm not going to point you out. If you feel God calling you to the overflowing life, the abundant life, you feel him calling you to the table. Maybe you've wondered in the faith, but today we want to renew that relationship with Jesus. We want to come and, and be be led by the good shepherd and we want to join the table of the good host and today you want to just recognize that your cup is overflowing I want you to raise your hand if that's you today your cup is overflowing I need that cup I see hands may we remember that today maybe we've wandered in the faith we used to be on fire for Jesus that was a long time ago and life has hurt us and things have happened and, and we're just bruised, beaten, and our cup is empty. If God is calling you to come back to the table. It's here. It's waiting. It's, it, it's all that we could ever ask or imagine. I want to encourage you to take steps. I want to encourage you to talk to somebody. Don't leave here without a conversation. 
We're going to get you plugged in in discipleship. We're going to get you plugged in in, 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 in serving the church. We're going to get you plugged in in growing your walk with Jesus. I also want you to, to take a second and reflect on that first part we talked about. Prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. And maybe over the course of the past 13 months or maybe our whole life, um, maybe we've had the wrong enemy. We know it. If that's us today, and, and we feel, and, and maybe it, it has nothing to do with anything that we even talked about, but you, you feel a, a call to, to change how you treat your enemies. You feel a call to change how you view who's an enemy and who's not. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand today. Raise your hand today. Amen. God, we come today longing to be at your table thankful that we can sit here and drink from the overflow and life is going to happen and, and things are going to pour this out but your goodness, your love, your mercy, it never stops the overflow is forever may we be reminded of that in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our struggles may we play chess while everyone else is playing checkers we have our enemies May that be our strategy. Love them. That's our only play. We wonder why there's such a great divide between Christians and non-Christians, the right and the left, or the left and the right. It's often because those that follow Jesus Christ are in the mud fighting with the pigs. And we operate on a different level. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your love and mercy that you show us. We praise you for this table. And if we don't know you as our Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. If we've wandered from the faith, that today would be the day of the great return. If we've grown unguided in who our enemy is, may today be the day of repentance. And may we open up our arms to people that don't look like us, that sing different music than we sing, that clap on the different beat than we do, we open our arms. May we welcome people home, even if they don't look like us. We love you. We thank you. Be with us in this place. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.